Even where various groups within a conquered country have all been subjected to or given access to the culture of the conquerors, their receptivity to that culture has often varied radically. And obviously their receptivity is going to vary because most people do not like being conquered, right? And on top of that, it also depends on what the conquering group is asking in return to learn what they have to offer, right? And in this case, the conquerors, they were asking for something that was far more than minimal, right? They were asking people to send their children to these Christian schools in exchange for education. And this worked out for some, but it was unacceptable for others, as we will see as we continue reading in the book Race and Culture by Dr. Thomas Sowell. Sometimes there has been a deliberate decision to remain removed from the new culture, as when Muslim groups in various African and Asian countries under European colonial rule refused to become involved in the schools and other institutions set up by Christian missionaries there. This is a pit created by the European colonizers. They set these schools up under the supposed good faith right? But there's always a caveat. And in this case, if the people want to attend those schools, what do they have to do? They have to be taught about the Caucasian Jesus, right? Understand that this is a chess move by the colonizers and Christianity has been used as a major tool in the spread of the idea of white supremacy and everybody else inferiority, right? It's a tool, right? It's a tool to trap the mind into the pit. And most people they won't understand this until they climb out of that pit. And then at that point, it becomes very obvious, as clear as daylight, right? But the Muslims, they were facing a dilemma because if they let their kids go to these Christian schools, then they knew that those kids um, had a very high chance of becoming agents for the Christian religion. But if they didn't let them go to those schools, then they missed out on, on the education, right? So it's a tricky scenario that we have right here. In many cases, missionary schools were the only schools, so that those outside the missionary school system were permanently handicapped in all competitions requiring skills and education, whether in clerical occupations, the medical or legal professions, in the military officer corps, or in scientific or engineering fields. Look at how the game was set up. Brilliant stuff by the colonizers. And so what it's basically saying, without saying it outright, is that the kids need to be Christians and they have to worship the God of the colonizers if they want to be educated. Truly brilliant stuff from the, the colonizer perspective. And watch how this played out. Throughout the colonial era in Nigeria, for example, the vast majority of the Western educated Nigerians were from the Southern region of the country, while the majority of the population lived in the predominantly Muslim North. So most of the population lived in the North and they were mostly Muslims. And the minority of the people lived in the South, which became Western educated in the missionary schools. Let's keep going. As of 1912, for example, there were fewer than a thousand students in elementary school in Northern Nigeria, compared to more than 35,000 in the rest of the country. Remember that the Christian missionary schools were the only schools. So most of the Muslims in the North, they decided not to let their children go to those schools. And only about a thousand from the North did, which is where the vast majority of the population lived. But 35,000 people from the South and other areas, they went to those Christian educated schools. A quarter of a century later, there were still fewer than 100 secondary school students receiving Western education in the Northern region, compared to more than 4,200 in the rest of Nigeria. Such educational disparities had enduring consequences. 25 years later, the Muslims still didn't budge, right? They were adherent to their faith, which obviously they believed to be more important than, than that Christian education. Right, and this was a cause, and it had an effect later on down the road, just like every other cause has an effect. Of 160 Nigerian physicians in the country in the early 1950s, only one was from the Hausa Fulani people who were dominant in the north, while there were 49 Igbos and 76 Yorubas from the southern regions of the country. Remember that the north was where most of the population lived, and the south had the minority of the people, but they were outperforming them in these areas, right, and other areas too, as we'll see. In the army, three quarters of the riflemen were Hausa Fulani, while four fifths of the officers were Southerners. Riflemen are lower level jobs in the military, right? These are frontline jobs, while the officer jobs, these are upper level management positions. As late as 1965, one half of Nigeria's officer corps were Evos, a historically less prosperous group to advance themselves. Even within Northern Nigeria, Southern Nigerians dominated many occupations requiring education, skills, or entrepreneurship. 
Nigeria was by no means unique in such disparities or in the rearrangements of group rankings in the wake of cultural transformations wrought by colonial rule. In colonial Ceylon, the Tamo minority located in the less fertile northern tip of the island seized upon Western education to a far greater extent than the Senegalese majority who, as Buddhists, were resistant to Christian missionary education. You see the similarities in the scenarios? The Buddhists in Sri Lanka, they had a similar predicament as the Muslims in Nigeria. And so the colonizers, they used the same game plan, right? They wanted the minds of the people in exchange for education, which I can see how this was a tough decision to make for these people, right? And so it's a checkmate move for the colonizers because like I said, they use Christianity as a means to implant the ideas of white supremacy and everybody else inferiority, right? They made God, Jesus, and all the angels in the image of the Europeans. And then those symbols, they take roots in, uh, in the minds of the children at those missionary schools. And then later on, as those roots begin to grow, it makes it nearly impossible for you to get that thing out of there, right? This is brilliant stuff we're talking about in the game plan of the colonizers. But nonetheless, a portion of those Tamil minority, they chose to get educated under the Christian education system. As of 1912, there were more physicians from the Tamil minority than from the Sinhalese majority. As of 1942, the Ceylon Tamils, who were 11% of the population, were more than 30% of all the students in Ceylon University College. In 1945, on the eve of independence, the Tamils were 30% of the civil servants and held 40% of the judicial posts in the country. The superior educational achievements of the Tamils continued on into the post-independence era. As of 1969, in what was now the independent nation of Sri Lanka, the Tamil minority provided 40% of all university students in the sciences, including 48% in engineering and 49% in medicine. You see that? Both in Nigeria and in Sri Lanka, the success of upstart minorities provoked political backlashes, group quotas, mob violence, and ultimately civil war. And this is typically the outcome when people see other groups pulling far ahead and they start feeling like the other group has an unfair advantage, right? It's just what comes with the game, right? And it's also the result of holding on to certain belief patterns and not taking advantage of the opportunity. Now, to be fair, right, knowing what I know now, I can't see myself leading people into the Christian faith as a trade-off for education, man. I just can't see it, right? I don't see that as a fair exchange in this instance because, like I said, when the Christian doctrine is instilled in people's minds, it's a super hard thing to get out, right? And I would never want people to have to go through that type of torture, right? So I might have done um, uh, what the Buddhists and the Muslims did and just sit out, on, sit it out on the sidelines, right? Because I just don't see this as a good deal, right? Because it's helping people climb out of one pit, but at the same time, it's dragging people down into another, right? So in this case, we would have had to figure something else out, right? To help us climb out of the educational pit and enter into the free world where life is much better and it makes more sense, right? And so this is the end of part seven commentary on the book Race and Culture by Dr. Thomas Sowell. And I wanna thank you for watching all the way into the end. My name is Brooklyn St. Michael and I'll see you in the free world.